Welcome to this series of podcasts on the beauty and power of liturgical art. Created through the Chichester Workshop for Liturgical Art and our associates, we explore how God reveals himself to us through the material world and how we, as a union of matter and spirit, can worship God through works of material beauty. Welcome, and it's a great pleasure to be here with Aidan Hart. Aidan, you've been going around and doing a number of podcasts, which you can find variously on YouTube and through the Chichester Workshop with other people. And here's a chance for me, Jim Blackstone, I studied under you uh, some of the skills of liturgical arts. And here's an opportunity to draw on your experience of some four decades in the liturgical arts. And what we want to focus on today is the ways in which the worship of the church pours out into the surrounding culture. And perhaps you can start with some description of um, moving into that worship, the processes of moving in as a person fully participating in the worship of the church, before we then go out and see how that worship pours out into the world around it. Mm. Yes, I think there's always a danger of thinking of worship as just an isolated one hour we might have in church and life goes on afterwards. So. Um, if we can pretend we're sort of on a journey um, uh, from, from uh, say, Sunday morning, so we perhaps walk to church or drive to church, um, perhaps the more romantic, rich image might be um, of a monastery. I, I was a novice in Mount Athos, and uh, my monastery is Veyron. And when you first arrive there, to say you're a pilgrim, um, you might do the final stretch coming to the monastery but walk along the beach from the neighbouring monastery. So really one's experiencing the raw material of God's creation. I, I, I like to think of the whole cosmos as a big church made by God, not by man. So uh, then you walk up the um, man-made cobbled path. So you think, oh, these are beautiful stones from the beach, but they've been arranged by man. So really there's a bit of a liturgy. Littered gear means the work of the people. So man and God's creation, raw creation, raw materials, God and minerals have intermingled in some way. So really I'm getting an idea, something's changing. Um, then one goes into the courtyard, which is semi-enclosed but open to the heavens. So you've got God's sort of created the dome of this church, but you're surrounded by man-made walls. And then you go into the narthex, so the ex-narthex first, if you're lucky enough to have one. And... Many of the monasteries there had the sun and the moon and all the creation praising God based on the last three psalms of the scriptures. So there you think, actually all the things I've just seen, the fulfillment is actually to praise God. And St. Leontius of Cyprus did say that the sun and moon do not praise God of themselves, but through me they worship God. We're like the mouthpiece of creation. Um, so then you admire all this and realize actually... Um, the world that has walked out of inverted commas is actually one big temple. So I should have been praising God before he even came. Then you go into this rather dark narthex, which has um, frescoes of ascetics there, and you realise actually, to experience this continual life of worship, I need to repent, I need to be purified, I need ascesis. Ascetic comes from the word ascesis in Greek, which means to exercise. So they struggle here, and these guys have got sunken cheeks, they're the warriors that struggle. But then I notice through this door, this light-filled um, nave, and I look at the floor, and this one at Iveron is um, cosmetic, it's sort of a, a mosaic floor, and um, the abbot used to say, uh, I thought the power to Malay all of this floor says everything, and you can see, even though it's made of really hard stone, a lot of porphyry, it's slightly undulating, and you realise, actually, that's worn like that for millions and millions of footsteps of people praying, going left and right, venerating icons, and it's just a better matter, but yet it's praising God in its own way. And then you smell fragrance, it's, it's embodied. The incense is actually soaked into everything, so even if there's not a service, you smell it. Then you see the light moving, there's no electrical light, and light's moving, and you see the icons, the faces of the saints, and there's gold, and then you stay there, and the service begins. And the deacons come out sensing, so you smell in God, and all the senses are used, you kiss the icons, all the senses are used, and ultimately you taste Greet God through the communion. So that's that movement. So the liturgy begins actually outside and it's culminated inside. Yeah, and, and all that is brought in with the gifts of the exactly. person and the community who gather in that yeah. place. And then they come out in their own and diverse ways in the way that they live uh, in 
the world outside of those walls of the church. But can I start on a broader view, perhaps, before we get to more of the individual lives? And you mentioned the praise of the sun and the moon, which brings us into the large field of contemporary concern and uh, endeavour, which is the relation of humanity to the environment outside of um, humanity. Uh, what can worship that you've described so beautifully there um, instill in us by way of a healthy way of living mm. in the world of the created environment? Yes, I think we act as we see if we have a wrong vision of the world, then we'll act wrongly. So if something's going wrong with our ecological disaster, obviously things are going wrong, we're mistreating the world. So apart from just looking for practical solutions, technological changes of habits, we need to ask, well, why did this go wrong? How were we seeing incorrectly? And to my mind, and a lot of theologians have written about this, basically we ceased to see the world first as God's revelation. If I see a tree, a stone, a bird, as, as God singing to me, God saying, I love you, I love you. This is my um, wedding present, or this engagement present to you. Not the wedding yet, that doesn't happen yet, but engagement present, saying, I love you, I want you to know me. This is a gift, it's not me, it's a gift. If I see the world that way, I'm going to treat it with profound respect. I still need to cut down trees to make wood, to make houses. I still need to interact with the world, but I'll do it in a different way. I'll only cut down as many trees as I need to to live. And even then, the cutting down of a tree will be to transfigure it, to transform it. You know, I carve icons out of wood sometimes. So I like to think the tree is happy to be chopped down with respect and then treated with loving care as I play in the wood and then carve it and transfigure just a hunk of wood into the face of Christ or a saint. So there, there's a sort of not just a honouring the word of God spoken through the raw material of the cosmos, but I'm also lifting it to a high level, making it more articulate in the praise of God. And all that can start with the liturgy. If that's how I experience my relationship with the rest of the material world and liturgy, I'm more likely to treat the world like that. So I think at the heart of our ecological crisis is the wrong way of worshipping. It's the wrong object of your worship. The, the obvious example is just a straight materialist. They might worship matter. It's just a means of becoming rich or gaining kudos because you've got a Rolls Royce rather than a beaten up rusty car. Um, but, um, but even a nature worshipper, you know, they're, they're, or one who honours creation and they're all oh, they're beautiful, I love sunrises. Well, that's all very nice. It is a beautiful thing. But it has got meaning. To me, it has meaning because it's God saying every day, let the sun rise again. I love that. Do it again. It's an expression of love. So I th think we need to dig, dig below um, the surface of ecological crisis and say, why? You know, why do we treat the world like this? And worship's the answer. True worship rooted in God is the answer. You mentioned a couple of points there which relate to the notion of time. One, so the sun rising, and then you say the wedding's not yet. So um, what does the worship um, shape in a human as regards the way that they live out their daily lives in a world which is so often timed to the second, or some people have a laxity of time without enough of societal support for them to find expression? Um, Again, if we, we had that beautiful entry into the church, now we're moving out. What does worship structure for a person in terms of the fullest sense of time? Yes, in, in Greek, as you know, um, there are two words for time that are used in the scriptures and in theological writing, chronos and kiros. Chronos is clock time, chronology comes from that. So in, chron in, in chronos, it can only be at one place, one time at a time. It's sort of linear. Um, kiros is divine time, um, so it's difficult to describe, but um, Christ, for example, in the book of Revelation says, I am he who is, who was, who is to come. But all those are contained in the person of Christ. If I know Christ, I can sense the past and, and the future. The past makes sense. Like the whole of the Old Testament is a type of Christ. I understand the temple, the Old Testament temple, the tent of meeting in Christ. Um, Churches face east toward the rising sun, and most of the early mosaics and uh, apses in Rome show Christ, but with sunrise covered clouds. So you're looking at Christ coming to me in the present, out of the future. 
So this is why the Bible starts with a garden in Eden, but ends with a verdant city, the New Jerusalem. That's the direction we're, we're moving. Um, the three words, um, art, religion, and culture, are very interesting. They're interrelated. Art comes um, at heart from the word ars, artist, to fitly join together. An articulated truck, an articulate person joins words together. Um, religion, religio, means to rejoin. And culture means both worshipping God, but also to cultivate, to not just leave raw soil, but to cultivate it so that it, it, it grows lots of plants. So um, all these are sort of joined together harmoniously, a synergy. Um, so death is basically the severance of, of time, but in Christ, he's that, as it were, eating chronos, <laughs> and he's transformed it into kiros. So I'm not afraid of death, because death has been overcome. Um, if it, I don't like the question, but when people say, can you prove the evidence of God? I say, do you love people? And they might say, I just love one person even. Even if there's one love. What can happen when that person dies? Will love have no meaning there? So to me, love is, is evidence, at the least of our spiritual nature, because Christ has become time. Time is eternal. Created time carries on. So that's why we keep praying for people who have died. It's impossible to stop loving when the person has died. You want to naturally keep on loving them, and the only way to do that is to believe that they live forever, that we can still commune uh, with them. It's quite interesting in, in response to the question on the abstract notion of time, that you return again and again to this, the person, Christ coming from the future, you know, Christ with us, knowing Christ, the nature of love between persons. Um, what, how does that worship, which we're now within in the church as we go out of the church, um, how does that worship uh, inform us of the nature of the human person and, and their place within the environment? Mm. You've touched on it variously, but if we mm. could bring that together a little bit. A very important point. This, this term person is so important. Um, one of the reasons for establishing, helping to establish the Chichester Workshop for Liturgical Art is to encourage more figurative liturgical art in churches and of the right type because life with Christ is all to do with relationship. It's not an ism, it's not a philosophy, it's not a system, it's relationship. And the word person means face, both in the Latin and, and the Greek, and a face is fulfilled in relationship. Jim becomes himself in relationship with Aidan, Aidan becomes himself in relationship with Jim. And while I'm looking at you, um, I'm not aware of myself, I'm just, just aware listening to you. And in as much as I forget myself and just immersed in what you're saying, then I, I understand more deeply and you feed to me the mysteries that you know, whereas why you're talking if I'm thinking of my own thoughts. You're dead to me and I'm dead to you. There's no relationship. I'm an individual, not a person. So healthy worship, if you go into a church with faces all around, then you realise actually, you know, even though I might be a hermit and just praying by myself, I'm not praying by myself. I'm joining in the worship of him, and I'm participating. And I was a hermit for seven years and frescoed by chapel. And even though most of the time I was by myself praying, I wasn't by myself. And that was kept alive by the fact that I was surrounded by saints. All faces, I realized that everything's relationship. And of course, God is Trinity, the Christian understanding. God is three persons, three faces, inverted commas. So when it says, let us make man in our image, that means it has to make man the community of men in our image. So if we to know God, we must love, because love is to participate in the communion of the three persons of the Trinity. And people can say, we don't need art, we don't need um, liturgical art for that, but we're made physical beings, we're made with eyes. So if we say a white wall is better, images will just get in the way. Well, it's almost a heresy. You know, we're denying our physicality. We say that God made a mistake really, made the material work. It's kind of get in the way. Um, through inanimate pigment on walls or whatever the image is made of, we're reminded of faces. Interesting. Well, you've given us, you've offered us this image of you in the monastery surrounded by faces, and now you, you're making us focus on this strong materiality mm. of the. Um, of one of the possible images through the pigment in liturgical art. What about the digital? Mm. Because there we have something that's not in, well, sourced in the material, but not entirely material. It, it's not face-to-face -face directly. How does that play out 
um, as informed by the nature of proper worship within the church. Mm. Yes, of course, this is a, a really major point of discussion at the moment, the place of digital technology. It's here to stay, so somehow we've got to um, find a way of using it in a healthy way. It's probably to do with hierarchy that um, you and I are here, present now, and we have a good relationship because we were shared a small studio for many years. I and mean, then sometimes we ring each other up, sometimes we Zoom call. Um, so the hierarchy is correct there. We have flesh-to-flesh -flesh encounters, and then that's sort of supported later on when it's not possible through digital technology. So I'm all for these are podcasts. Um, uh, I myself have benefited from podcasts, listening to great physicists, mathematicians, theologians talk. It would have been ridiculous to pay a £1,000 to fly to America to hear him for an hour and fly back. I can get more or less the same experience um, through digital technology. So it's a matter of hierarchy. It shouldn't replace direct human relationship because we are incarnate beings. There's a danger that particularly the young people uh, get involved so much in a virtual world that that becomes for them the real world and the real world is a reflection of the virtual. There's real danger, but it's just a matter of proportion, I think. We, we entered the church... Um, and you describe the lighting, you describe the effects. Now, those effects are going to be different throughout the church year. And whilst we're thinking here about the implications for worship on virtual and real life, on the nature of time and daily life and so on, can we think, as we turn a little bit to the seasons of the church, how mm -hmm. they affect a person? Mm -hmm. uh, and you've written recently on festival icons, and there you, you've approached the notion of time at the beginning of that. As we draw out from the, the daily uh, turning of the sun, which you referenced earlier. What could you say here about the way in which the seasons of worship mm. assist a person in living a life towards union with God? That's a very important point. Um, one of the Greek words for beautiful is oreos, which means timely. So if a flower bursts into flower too early, the frost will get it and it will die and it won't produce fruit and the plant won't be able to propagate itself. So we think to ease out of your beauty is just an object with a certain harmony that is beautiful, but also there's a beauty, beauty of time. I suppose choreography is like that, isn't it? It's, it's, and, and music is actually the arrangement of things through time. So the church's year is beauty expressed through time. Uh, and God created us to have change. If something doesn't change, it's dead. Um, so in its wisdom, the church has developed this liturgical year. There's the penitential time of Lent. You could say that's the dark. The Hebrew day begins at sunset, interestingly, and then progresses toward the light. So we, we start, in a sense, with, 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 with Lent, the darkness, and then gradually we come toward the light. Um, but interestingly, the high point of the church year is actually Pentecost. Um, we can say Easter is the most important, which it is in one way, because through the cross, through the death and resurrection of Christ, everything comes. But we, we, we tend to measure the day of the, the year, the week of the year rather, from Pentecost. We say it's the third week after Pentecost. Why? Because Pentecost is when humans were fulfilled by being deified. In other words, not just merely human, but God-bearing humans, bearers of the Holy Spirit, Christophori, Christ-bearers. So that's the birth of the full person, um, as it were, we were fashioned and created, um, it's not a mechanical um, image, but a, 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 a digital projector can be made, it comes out of a factory, but it's not actually projecting anything. You plug it in, it glows, and you put images through, then it's fulfilled as a projector. So Pentecost is where this foreign energy, the Holy Spirit, the creator enters the creation. Um, so the whole of the church year is sort of taking us through the rhythm of repentance, introversion, self-analysis through to re-entering the community of the church, the descent of the Holy Spirit, then the cycle begins again. And a cycle, I want to come towards where that cycle is eventually being brought to. Mm. Um, but here to address, as we're thinking about worship, moving into the world if I can put it like that, how it is that it, you know, just in the, in the daily life people can bring with them something of this great vision mm. as you describe of worship within the minutiae, let's say, of, of all of our daily lives. Yeah, there's a danger, isn't there, of just getting a bit 
bit cuddly about, oh, that's a beautiful service, and that sort of thing. That's a nice little pocket of experience. Um, but um, worship of God is serious stuff. You know, it's, it's martyrdom. You can, you can worship God, and I know people in Russia, like uh, Alexander Algorodnikov, um, who suffered in prison for years. Um, so sometimes it's tough in the world. You know, you've got difficult children. Your life is hard in the world. So how does one marry this paradise in those one or two hours with all the hardship and the suffering in the world? It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Um, after the apostles saw Christ transfigured, they wanted to stay there, but Jesus said, no, we've got to go down, and he himself was crucified later. So the various practical things, um, I was a novice monk for quite a few years, and that intensely taught me the power of the Jesus prayer. So it's one practical thing, you can practice some form of prayer directed toward Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. So by trying to train oneself in this prayer, some other prayer, you can develop what some of the fathers called an involuntary prayer. We start saying it by will, but then gradually it can enter our heart. So while you're with someone, you're aware that Christ is with you, that the prayer is beating away. And this way one can carry the light of that liturgy. Also, through the liturgy, we can begin to see everyone as people made in God's image. Just driving here today, I heard a radio program about people who've been in prison I put in this intermediate sort of farm area or working in the world. Um, and this couple who had such a prison farm said they wanted two people who were really transformed by the experience and because they treated them with respect. And this transformed them. You know, they were treated as someone in the image of God. And before they'd been treated, labelled as a criminal, always bad. So they, ex they expected to be bad, so they acted badly. So this just one person who treated them with respect transformed them. So there are many ways, I think, in which true worship profoundly affects the way that we act in the world. And one is if we can sustain this in a prayer, that in itself helps us to see the image of Christ in the, in the most horrible person. This horribleness and badness is always a distortion of the good. Evil doesn't exist in itself. And secondly, it can help us to see everyone in the image of God and the many other fruits of true worship are there too that come to mind. So that we are in the world as it is, you created this, the picture of the suffering and, and the world and the way in which they can come together. And if we, as we thought before, think about the way that all of that, that union of heaven and earth um, is finally fulfilled, there we are um, with, with a sense of the completion of, of um, divine calling um, as, as we might understand it. Um, uh, at the end of times. Now, you, you've you recently painted uh, an, an image which has uh, elements. We talked about light and darkness earlier. It has a strip. And I'm asking you if you might mm. depict this image for us, mm. and, but also a light upon the relation of da dazzling darkness and light mm. there, mm. and then the relation between the two. You have Bethlehem, you have Jerusalem, you have River. Um, as, as we um, draw everything together, uh, this discussion that we've discussed to this point. Could you give us a description of that image mm. and say something then about the fulfilment um, at the end times of God's will for all being uh, in relation to worship? Well. Thank you, yes. So the background to this particular painting, which I finished um, in um, July 2023, uh, it's an apse, it's on the east side of the church, so already you're facing toward the future, toward the second coming of Christ. But also being an apse, it's like a womb, it's sort of a hemisphere, so really, it's, it's, it's God present with us here now. It's not a, a pointed Gothic art, um, art saying God is up there in the sky somewhere, God's with us. So in the middle is Christ, in the mandola. So this is a radiance of Christ. It's like a halo, but a halo that follows the shape of the body. But in a topsy-turvy way, the part closest to Christ, the heart of the mandola, is actually dark blue, opposite of what you'd expect. With an ordinary light, it'd be light close to the bulb and gets darker. But this is the opposite. So this mandala suggests that God in his essence is completely unknowable. God is dark to our mind because we can't experience that inner essence of God. But as you move out of mandala, it gets lighter. So God does come to us in his love and his wisdom. So there's the human Christ who's also divine. He's God incarnate. Either side is the mother of God on our left. Um, his mother, the one through whom God became man, on the right is St. Christopher, the patron of the church. This church, um, St. Christopher's in Codsall, and near Wolverhampton. 
as the relics of Saint Clear and Saint Dominic, so they're standing there. So in these five people, you have the whole body of Christ, as it were, Christ and the saints, male and female. Um, they're standing on the ground, I bet there are plants there, um, so you've got the vegetable and the animal kingdom there. Um, either side are two palm trees, which are symbols of paradise. When you walk through the desert, you see palms, and you know there's paradise there, there's water. Behind Christ, we're just about uh, brightly coloured, sunrise-coloured clouds. So immediately we know from that, we're looking at Christ coming to us out of the future. He's with us here, but also coming to us as the bride, groom for the bride. Above him is a cross with the Alpha Omega, and it's a jeweled cross, because Christ said that the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven when I, before I come. Um, and down below are 12 sheep, the 12 apostles, but also the whole church, coming out of Bethlehem and, and, and Jerusalem. Um, so that's both the beginning and end of Christ's life on it, but also the beginning of creation and the new Jerusalem. And the Lamb of God is in the middle. Down below uh, is, is the mineral kingdom, if you like, um, uh, faux uh, marble um, plaques painted on, so that's the mineral kingdom. So they're all there together. Everything's gathered in Christ. The mineral, vegetable, animal kingdom, the human kingdom, the angelic, all, all in Christ. It's a lovely way to draw things together in the sense that we walked with you into, as you described uh, Iviron, uh, the monastery chapel there, and then we explored various parts of the world in terms of space and time, really, and then we come to this sense of um, the promise uh, of Christ as he comes to us from the future. Aidan, thank you so much for sharing your experience here, your knowledge here, and for sharing it so widely, so openly to so many um, through these podcasts, through your work over the years. Aidan has done podcasts with a number of different people, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, and they are available on YouTube and through the Chichester Workshop. Thank you for watching today. Thank you, Jim. It's been a joy having time with you as always. Thank you so much, Aidan.